G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Life of Messiah. Tonight we'll be looking at his infancy and childhood, and I do pray that this will be a blessing to you. Thank you for coming along. Tonight we are looking at uh, his infancy and childhood, uh, paragraph 15 to paragraph 22. Oh, welcome along to all of you who are coming in tonight. Um, Last week, we just, do, sorry, three weeks ago, let's do a recap. Uh, we estimate the birth of Jesus to be around about 6 or 7 BC. Uh, the Shekinah glory announces his birth to the shepherds in the field. Two signs that were given. The baby would be wrapped in swaddling cloths and he would be in a, in a manger, swaddling cloths with so strips of cloths, not what you'd normally wrap the baby in. And he'd be in a manger, a manger is a feeding trough, so it means that he's not going to be in a house, he'll be in a stable somewhere, a stable cave. We see that Jesus is circumcised at eight days old in conformity to the, the covenants, Abrahamic and Mosaic covenant. At 40 days, Mary takes Jesus to the temple for her ceremonial cleansing, uh, purification, and for the redemption of the firstborn, where you have to pay a, a, a tax. And she has, two, well, she and uh, Jesus has two encounters at the temple. We see one, Simeon. Simeon was a devout man and he was waiting for the Messiah uh, because the Holy Spirit uh, confirmed to him that he would not die until he saw the Messianic person. And uh, he confirmed that this boy, this boy Jesus, was the Messianic person. He said that there are two groups to benefit from him. He would be a light to the Gentiles, and he would also be for the glory of Israel. He also told Mary that he would be a point of division in the Jewish world. The second encounter was with Anna, who was a prophetess. She was just over 100 years old, but she also recognized that this child was the messianic person. Now, we also encountered the Magi, the, the wise men uh, from the east, Mesopotamia. They saw his star and they arrived in Jerusalem to bring gifts to this Jewish king. Um, now the connection between these Magi or Magi and the star, uh, we have two connections. We have, first of all, we have Daniel, who was, uh, who was one of the Jews taken into exile into Babylon. He was a statesman, and he wrote the Messianic timetable. He prophesied the Messianic timetable as to when Messiah would come. And then there was a, a, a Mesopotamian seer called Balaam, who also prophesied that a star would herald his coming. So we have the timetable. We have the star. Wise men, when they saw the star, says the king is born. They brought three gifts. They brought, brought, brought gold. Uh, signifying his kingship, frankincense signifying his deity, and the myrrh uh, signifying his death and sacrifice. Now, Herod finds out, uh, you know, when this entourage turns up, he finds out where the child is born and when the star appeared. The star appeared two years ago, they said. Okay, so we're up to tonight. Let's go. Here we go. We have, I put this in here to show us how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament and the rabbinic, uh, rabbinic uh, writings, they use a, um, a thing called Pardes, P-R-D-S. Four ways rabbinic writings quoted the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, here we see we have, uh, uh, we, the concept here is, uh, Pardes is an acronym uh, for four ways in which scripture was used. It was, it was a useful acronym to remind them of the four ways that Old Testament scripture could be utilized. First of all, we have P for Peshat. That means the simple, basic meaning of the text. It means literal, it's a literal prophecy, literal fulfillment. Remez, uh, which is a hint uh, literal prophecy plus a typical or a type. Then we have drash, which is the exposition, literal plus application. And then we had sod, which simply was a summation of what the prophet said. Uh, and so in, in summary, 
And what we see here is that this was the uh, rabbinic way of remembering valid ways to quote Old Testament scripture. And these four categories were used, were used by the writers of the New Testament. So, you know, if, if you didn't really uh, understand the ways in which scripture is being used, uh, one could mistakenly conclude that scripture, there are mistakes in scripture, but they're not. Okay. Now, literal prophecy plus literal fulfillment for Shat. An example of this uh, uh, is found in Matthew chapter 2, verse 5 to 6. In Matthew 2, 5, it says, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written through the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are in no wise least among the princes of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a governor who shall be a shepherd of my people Israel. Now, this quote in Matthew is from Micah 5.2. Micah prophesies the birth of the Messiah. The point of Micah 5.2 is that when the Messiah is born, he will be born in the town of Bethlehem in the region of Judah and nowhere else. Uh, not the Bethlehem of Galilee, because there was a Bethlehem up there as well, and not in any other town of Judah. That was the literal meaning of the prophecy. The literal interpretation of Micah 5.2, we see the Messiah when he was born, would be born in the town of Bethlehem within the, the tribal uh, territory of Judah. New Testament records the literal fulfillment of that literal prophecy. Where was Jesus born? He was born in the town of Bethlehem in the tribal region of Judah. So he was not born in some other town. He was born in Bethlehem. He was not born in Bethlehem of Galilee, for instance. So Matthew, when he's writing, he shows that the prophecy of Micah 5.2 was literally fulfilled by the birth of the Messiah. So this, what we see here is, this is a literal New Testament fulfillment of a literal Old Testament prophecy. So we have an example here of the first way in which the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, and that is literal prophecy plus literal fulfillment. Micah's prophecy makes only one point, and when it is fulfilled by an event recorded in the New Testament in the perfect way, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. So there, there are several other examples, but for time, this is what we have to do. Literal plus typical or type. Remez, Matthew 2.15. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt did I call my son. Here, Matthew quotes Hosea 11.1, 1, the context of which is not a prophecy. It is speaking of a literal historical event, the Exodus. The background to Hosea 11.1 1 is Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 to 23 where Israel as a nation is the son of God. It says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So when God brought Israel out of Egypt, it is pictured by Hosea 11.1 1, as God bringing his son out of the land of Egypt. And that is the literal meaning of Hosea 11.1. 1. It's a historical verse dealing with a historical event, the Exodus. Now, the literal Old Testament becomes, uh, that event becomes a type of a New Testament event because the ideal son of God, uh, the messianic son of God, Messiah himself, he came. Now, when Jesus as a babe was brought out of the land of Egypt, God was again bringing his son out of Egypt. So what we see here is that this is a type and an anti-type. So it's a, it, it's a literal prophecy with a, a typical fulfillment. The type was Israel, the national son coming out of Egypt. The anti-type is the messianic son of God also coming out of Egypt. The third is literal plus application. Drash means exposition or explanation. Now, 
Um, what we see here is that in Matthew chapter 2, verses 17 to 18, then was fulfilled that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she would not be comforted because they are not. Now, Matthew here quotes from Jeremiah 31.15, where Jeremiah 31.15 says, Thus says Jehovah, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are not. Now, what's this all about? When Jeremiah prophesied this, this was a current event in Jeremiah's day. He was witnessing uh, the women of Ramah where Rachel, the symbol of Jewish motherhood, was buried. So there the women were there. They were crying as they were seeing their sons being taken to exile in Babylon. They would never see them again. So what Jeremiah prophesied was here, he says, Rachel, Rachel, the, the, the symbol of Jewish motherhood, was weeping for the children, the Jewish men who were being taken away into exile. So the events of Jeremiah, sorry, so based upon this one point of, of small similarity here, an Old Testament verse was quoted and applied to what was a current situation for the New Testament writer. The events of Jeremiah have a point of similarity with the events in Bethlehem. Jewish mothers were weeping for sons they'll never see again. Rama and Bethlehem are different towns. And the Babylonian exiles weren't going to their death as were the infants of Bethlehem. So everything is quite radically different, except for the one point of similarity, which was the mothers weeping. So we have here a literal prophecy plus an application. And then we have the summation uh, or sod, uh, meaning secret or hidden. This is a, a summary. In Matthew 2, 23, Matthew 2, verse 23. And came and dwelled in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, that he should be called a Nazarene. So the apparent quotation is he should be called a Nazarene. But guess what? There is no such statement in scripture. There's nothing about that in the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew scriptures. There is no exact quotation or prophecy. But when the word prophet, which we see prophet here, it now becomes, it moves from singular uh, to plural. It's now a summation of what the prophets said. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, plural. It's a bit of a clue. So we're getting what we're getting here is we're getting the summary of what the Old Testament taught about the Messiah. Uh, this is not 100%, but it is uh, fairly regular. Now, if you search the Old Testament for a mention of Nazareth, the only, re only very remote possibility or similarity is Isaiah 11.1. 1. Um, and it says, there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, and a branch out of his roots shall bear fruit. Now, uh, this calls Messiah a netza, N-E-T-Z-E-R, which means a branch. And it simply, it just sounds similar to Nazareth. That, that's, that's the closest thing you can find. But the point that Matthew is making is that Jesus would be despised and rejected of men as the Nazarenes were despised in their culture. That's, that's the point that Matthew is making here. This, this attitude is reflected in John chapter 1, verses 45 to 46, which we'll see later on. And Nathanael said unto him, uh, unto Philip, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, Isaiah 53, 3 and, uh, and other scriptures foretold the fact that he was despised, Jesus was despised and forsaken of men. So this is what the prophets were speaking about, that he would be a despised individual. Okay, now we're looking at his infancy in Egypt. Uh, and we see this in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. 
Yeah, Matthew's theme of kingship, this is Herod's greatest fear. Herod's fear was that a king would rise up to supplant him. And now Matthew also highlights the fulfillment of prophecy in, uh, in Hosea, Hosea 11.1. 1. Out of Egypt did I call my son. And he also quotes Jeremiah 31.15, which we just saw. Now, what about Herod? Herod was called Herod the Great for all the great works of building he accomplished. But, but really, Herod was an absolute paranoid. He was always, this is what Josephus writes. Josephus, uh, writing about him, records his biography that, that he was always fearful that someone was out there conspiring to take his throne away. And at the mere suspicion which came out of his own deluded mind, his psychosis, he would actually kill and execute. <laughs> In actual fact, he killed his favorite wife, Mariamne, and three of his own sons because he thought they were conspiring against him. Uh, this man is paranoid. And as a result of killing one of his sons, Caesar Augustus once said, it was safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. Why would he say that? Well, because Herod was a nominal convert to Judaism and he would not eat pork. Therefore, Herod's pigs were safe. However, to be one of Herod's sons was an occupational hazard. Now, through these wise men that we saw in the last session, Herod has now concluded that there is a two-year-old boy in Bethlehem conspiring to take his throne. And when he realizes the wise men skip town without reporting back to him, he takes matters into his own hands. And so what he does is he organizes a raiding party for slaughter. And uh, he ordered his soldiers to go down to Bethlehem and to kill every male child of two years and under. And we see this in Matthew 2.16. Why does he use a two-year figure? Well, verse 16, he had carefully learned of the wise men. So that tells us. What that tells us is how long it was since the star first appeared. The star first appeared two years ago. Now, in verse 13, before the army arrives, an angel warns Joseph to take his family and flee to Egypt and to stay there until he's told to return. So remember, Matthew is writing, he's writing this, and Matthew only is, ever talks about Joseph. Joseph plays the active role. Now, since they're a poverty-stricken family, where did they get the money to take such a journey? Well, you know, we just saw before that the three, sorry, not the three wise men. Yeah, that's a misnomer. Uh, they're not three wise men. They're three gifts. Don't forget, it's not we three kings of, was it Wensler Sass? It's just three gifts. We don't know how many there was. There was an entourage. But they just, they, they, Mary and Joseph had just received gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they now have finances. They can head off down into Egypt. They can leave. The army arrives and kills all the children two years and younger. Messianic child Jesus, he's spared. He now stays in Egypt for one, the next one or two years. And now we see he heads back to Nazareth. And, and this is in Matthew chapter 2 verses 19 to 23, and Luke chapter 2, verse 39. So when Herod finally died in, in the year 4 BC, an angel now appears to Joseph again, and he tells him to go back. He says, go back into the land of Israel, for they are dead that sought the young child's life. We see this in Matthew 2, verse 20. So when the family uh, returned to Israel, the first area they come to was Judea, it's the closest to Egypt. And we see this in the Matthew account. So remember, we're only seeing Joseph's account here. Now, Herod's kingdom uh, was inherited by his sons, and it did not remain intact, but was divided into three parts among them. The one that was given Judea and Samaria in verse 22 was Archelaus. As bad as Herod the Great was, Archelaus was actually worse. And when he had ascended to his throne, he had 3,000 Jews killed in a temple compound on Passover. 
uh, you know, his, his reign was so uh, corrupt and bloody that he only reigned uh, 10 years before Rome took his crown away and exiled him. So now Joseph, he's afraid and being warned again by God in a dream, what happens is he bypasses Judea and he went up to Nazareth in Galilee because that was reigned by another son called Antipas and he was far better. Now, settlement in the town of Nazareth now stigmatizes Jesus for the rest of his life. Because Joseph heads back to Nazareth, Jesus was now frequently referred to as a Nazarene. You see this in uh, chapter 2, verse 23 of Matthew. And the thing is, you know, that while, while Judeans look down on Galileans in general, Galileans look down on those among them who came from Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth was, a, was a, a town of ill repute. Um, and why? Because it was actually a base of a Roman garrison. And uh, Jews who lived there were viewed as traitors. Galileans were considered materialistic and ignorant in spiritual matters. Uh, the, the, the rabbis say, the, the rabbi writings say that, you know, if you're interested in getting rich, then you need to go north to Galilee. But if you're interested in obtaining divine spiritual wisdom, you need to head south because that's where the rabbinic schools and the seminaries uh, and all the academies were located down in Judah, in Jerusalem area. So in John 1, when one of his future disciples was told, we have found him, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, in John 1.45, the response was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So settling in Nazareth made Jesus a despised and rejected individual. But again, that was part of prophecy. It was prophesied that he'd be, he'd be despised and rejected. Now, his boyhood and, and his growth. We, <laughs> we got one verse. Luke is the only gospel writer who addresses Jesus' boyhood and growth, and he takes a whole one verse to summarize the development of Jesus from age 4 to 12. So eight years of Jesus' life is covered in this one verse. Um, so it says, and the child grew and waxed strong, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That covered eight years. Whatever else we need to know about his human development, we have to seek outside sources for this. Uh, first of all, uh, we know some things about Jewish upbringing in those days. Yeah. Now, we know, for, we know that Jesus grew up in a spiritual home uh, because both Mary and Joseph were part of the believing remnant of the day. Yeah, basic program of Jewish studies for a, for a young boy uh, in a typical Jewish home of his time, by the age of five, five years old, a son would begin to study the written law, the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures. The five-year-old would now begin to study those. By the age of 10, a son would begin studying the rabbinic traditions or what is called the oral law, uh, which is the Mishnah, We'll cover these later. Um, now, a key, a key educational method was memorization. Um, so even the youngest of the students studied seven days a week. Uh, on the Sabbath, they were not given any new material, but spent time memorizing what they had learned in the days before. And this is, <laughs> this is these are young boys. At the age of 12, a son would be apprenticed to a profession, either his father's profession at home, or he would be sent to live with another family member to learn another profession. If he was to be trained for the, to become a rabbi, he would be sent to live with a rabbi at age 12, and he would be ordained at age 30. So this is 18 years of study to become a rabbi. At age 13, he would have his bar mitzvah. Um, actually, the term bar mitzvah wasn't around then. It was not used in first century Israel. But there was, at that time, a, it was a coming of age ritual that would later become known by the, by the term bar mitzvah. And then between the ages of 16 to 20, 
uh, they would marry, but not in Jesus's case. And so Jesus underwent this basic training at his home and synagogue. Now, that does not explain his tremendous knowledge because we see at the age of 12, how could he carry on an intelligent conversations of the law with the teachers of the law in the temple compound? Here is one example where we now learn something of the messianic person from the Jewish scriptures that is not detailed in the, in the New Testament. It's not written up in the New Testament, but we do know from Isaiah chapter 50, verses four to nine, Isaiah has several passages on the servant of Jehovah, which that's his favorite term for, for the Messiah. And this Isaiah uh, chapter 50, verses four to nine, it's one of those passages where we learn a lot about his upbringing. In verse 1, we want to see who is speaking. It says, thus says the Lord. This is Isaiah 50, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, so Jehovah God is speaking. Verses 4 to 6. Uh, the Lord, this is, this is uh, Isaiah's prophecy. The Lord gave me a skilled tongue to know how to speak timely words to the weary. Morning by morning, he rouses me. He rouses my ear to give heed like disciples. The Lord God opened my ears and I did not disobey. I did not run away. I offered my back to the floggers and my cheeks to those who tore out my hair. I did not hide my face from insult and spittle. And it goes on through to verse 9. What we see here is that as Messiah was growing up, morning by morning, he was awakened by God the Father to be taken aside and to be trained and taught for his messianic mission. So besides his training at home in the synagogue, Jesus was privately tutored by God the Father. Now, we have to remember, we, no, no, we must remember this, that uh, Jesus was the God-man with two distinct natures, all right? Um, so as to his divine nature, omniscient, knows everything, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing. But as to his human nature, he had to undergo the same learning process that we have to do. And in the process in verse 5, he learned that his mission would involve a great deal of physical suffering that would eventually lead to his death. He did not rebel or was not disobedient in that which he was being taught. So in verse 6, when that day came for which he was trained, he would give his back to those who flogged him. He did not shield his back from the Roman scourge, nor did he try to cover his face from those spitting into it and from those pulling his beard out. So as a result of this training by God the Father, at the age of 12, Jesus knew exactly who he was, the Son of God. He also knew the scriptures so well that he was able to debate them with the scholars in the temple compound. So that's a little gem we learned from, from the Old Testament here. Now we see his, his, in his boyhood, he now visits Jerusalem, and we see this in Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 50. During his boyhood development, we have only one incident recorded from Scripture. And that is where he visits Jerusalem at the age of 12. Uh, verse 41 of Luke chapter 2 also shows us that his mother and stepfather were of the believing remnant of that day because they went up to Jerusalem at the Feast of Passover. Uh, and because that was required by Mosaic law. And we see this in, in Exodus 23, um, 14 to 16 and Deuteronomy 16, 1 to 8. Now, Three of the seven feasts required attendance in Jerusalem. Uh, we had Passover, Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, under rabbinic law, only the adult males were required to go. But Mary applied the Mosaic law to herself. Now, at 12, Jesus is now with the family unit. They head down to Jerusalem. And at this, at this particular time, Jerusalem was a city of about 80,000. Uh, and, and so uh, to the, he heads down there to the Passover observance in preparation 
this is in preparation for what we what we would call his bar mitzvah. Um, and again, this was in keeping with rabbinic tradition uh, for the of the first century. Why? Because after the son's 12th birthday, in preparation for his bar mitzvah at age 13, he was to be taken to Jerusalem for the observance of Passover. So this was a precursor to his uh, bar mitzvah the following year. Um, as we said before, the term bar mitzvah wasn't used in first century, but there was just this coming of age ritual that would later become known by this title. So what we see here is that his trip to Jerusalem at age 12 was in preparation for his, his bar mitzvah at age 13. And at age 13, uh, when he does his bar mitzvah, that's the day when he takes on uh, religious duties and responsibilities of an adult. At age 13, he, he's now classed as one of the adults who can uh, make up the synagogue. Something else at age 12, age 12, he also began his apprenticeship as a carpenter under Joseph, his dad, his stepdad. Carpenter is not really the, the proper term. It's more uh, a stone mason, stone cutter, because <laughs> there weren't that many trees in Israel. There are lots of rocks there. Um, so, you know, he, he'd be um, adept in both carpentry and stone cutting. Now, this passage that we see here records seven days of Jesus's life, uh, starting with two holy days. It says, when they had fulfilled the days in math, in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 43, the days referred to here are uh, the day of the Passover and the first day of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is straight after Passover. Uh, and you can't travel on, on, on any of those days. So here are the first two days. On the third day, the family now head off back up to Nazareth. Now, in those days, uh, people usually traveled uh, in groups or of various sizes. Uh, it was mainly for their protection. And so Mary and Joseph, they assume that Jesus is somewhere in, in the group. Um, it's a three-day walk from Jerusalem to Nazareth. So when they, when they get to the first night's lodging, hey, he's not here. He's not amongst the group. Where is he? So what do they have to do? They've had to travel back a whole day's journey back to Jerusalem. When they found him not, they returned. So when they, when they didn't find him in the group, they returned, which marks the fourth day. So two days in Jerusalem, one day travel up, one day travel back, four days. And then it came to pass after three days, Luke 2.46. So it took him another three days of searching around Jerusalem before they found him in the temple area. So now we have day five, six, and seven. And, and the reason why this is of note is because there are not many events in the life of Jesus recorded in the Gospels that provide that much daily detail. Um, that's why it's, you know, it's something to think about here. So when they finally find him, he's in the temple. He's in the temple and he's sitting in the midst of the doctors of the law. And these are the experts in the law and both hearing uh, what's hearing means that he was hearing he was hearing their deep theological discussions with understanding. That's what it means. And he was asking questions. And it says all were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So we have a couple of observations here. First of all, he was asking questions beyond the knowledge of a normal 12-year-old boy. And secondly, the doctors of the law were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, the third observation here is, remember Isaiah 50, his training by his heavenly father? Those doctors of the law were engaged with a 12-year-old for perhaps as long as five days. No normal 12-year-old. Also, they knew that the understanding he had, he did not get from the Nazareth school system. Remember, up there in Nazareth, you know, if you wanted to be spiritual, you had to be down in Judah. If you want to be rich, you get up north. So this shows the results of his individual training by God the Father. And we see it as this 12-year-old boy in the temple. And in verse 48, when Mary and Joseph found him, Mary asked him, why, what, you know, why, is he, why have you dealt so with us? Or 
why we dealt so poorly with us? Because we sought you sorrowing. Now, you know, Mary, just like any mother, she was anxious and, and quite upset that her 12 year old was missing. And here we have a typical uh, Jewish mother guilt trip. She says, son, why have you dealt with us so? Why have you made us feel so bad? I, I feel like you have to be sympathetic with her because she, you know, she was the only Jewish mother who had a perfect child. Uh, but, but she's obviously forgotten here who he was because, because part of her scolding of Jesus was, behold, your father and I sought you sorrowing. This is in Luke 2, verse 48. And here we have the first recorded statement of Jesus. And his response to his mother was, how is it that you sought me? Don't you know that I must be in my father's house? Several observations here. First thing, he reminds Mary that Joseph is not his father and that God was his father and that she should have known that he would be in his father's house. Now, you read it pretty easily there, but you know what? In the Greek, the Greek for in my father's house can also be translated as I must be about my father's business or about my father's occupation. Remember, he says this at age 12. So the second observation, that's the first observation. Second observation is that Jesus was about his father's business. Now, being apprenticed by Joseph as a carpenter, being apprenticed by his heavenly father for his messianic ministry. So by, the, so by the age of 12, he clearly understands his sonship with the father. He knows who he was and he knows his messianic mission. This is at age 12. Now we see his boyhood development in Luke chapter 2, verse 51 to 52. Now Luke is interested in Jesus' human development because remember the, the, the theme of, of, um, of Luke was Jesus in his humanity. He's human. He's man. He's a perfect man. And, and Luke in two short verses gives us 18 years or 18, 18 or so years of Jesus' life in Nazareth. Remember, he gave us, he gave us one verse from, from age, uh, for eight years, from age four to 12, uh, and now he gives us two verses from age 12 to around age 30. And in, and in verse 51, Luke says that Jesus was subject to Mary and Joseph and that Mary uh, takes all these things in her heart. She took Jesus' response I must be in my father's house and contemplated what this meant. And, and ultimately, she came to the understanding that her son was the messianic God man. She later revealed all these things to Luke, because this is how Luke knows about it here. Now, verse 51 here is the best verse in all scripture that shows that subjection is not a matter of inferiority or of superiority. It is a matter of subordination of divine order. Why? Because what we have here is Jesus is a superior. He's a sinless God man subjecting himself to two inferiors, two sinful human beings. So what we learn from this is that submission is a matter of subordination and divine order. It is not because, of, not because he was inferior to them, because he wasn't. So when a wife is asked to be in subjection to her husband, this also is not a status of superiority or inferiority, not at all. It is a matter of one co-equal subjecting him or herself to another co-equal to divine order. Was Jesus in fear to the Father? <laughs> no way. No way. We see this in Colossians, Colossians 1, um, 15 to 18, we see it in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Yet Jesus, in the divine order of the plan of God, subjected himself, subjected himself to God the Father. In verse 52, Luke says that Jesus now develops in four specific areas. 
<clears throat> Here we go. While in verse 16, Luke referred to, <clears throat> back, in, <clears throat> back in Luke, back in verse 16, Luke referred to Jesus as a, a, what we call a brethos, a baby. In verse 40, he called him, paid on a child. Verse 43, pays a boy. Now, in, uh, in verse 52, Luke summarized Jesus' human development one more time, explaining that he advanced or continued to grow until at the, at the approximate age of 30. His life story is now picked up again by the gospel narratives. Now, four areas in which Jesus developed were he advanced in wisdom, which means mentally. Uh, he advanced in stature, means physically. He advanced in favor with God spiritually. He advanced in favor with man, so he advanced socially. Uh, and he developed in these four areas just as we all have to, because why? In his humanity, he had to undergo a normal human development. Now we see the message to John. This is John the, the Baptist, John the Baptizer. He's the forerunner of, 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 of Jesus, forerunner of the herald, forerunner of the king, sorry. We see this in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and we see this in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Mark introduces his account of the life of Jesus. In Mark 1, verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus, Messiah, Son of God. What we see here is Mark doesn't start his gospel with the genealogy or the birth of Jesus, but he starts it with John, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Messiah. We see that in, in, in uh, uh, Mark, verse one, Mark chapter 1, verse 2. Second, it's the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. The term gospel means good news, but its content can only be determined by the context. So the good news in the four gospels will not always have the same content as found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Third thing we see here is that this Jesus is the Son of God. Mark says so. Messianic title. Now, the last time we saw we saw John, he had departed into the wilderness, um, wilderness of Judea. He'd separated himself from society, and in a specific year, he's called by the Lord to begin the mission for which he was born. And Luke gives the historical detail. Why? Because remember, Luke is writing for the historically minded Greeks. He needs to have details. And so he mentions a specific year. It says the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And Luke also mentions others who were in authority in that region. We had Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea and Samaria from 26 to 37 uh, AD. Remember, uh, when, we, when we last talked about the leadership uh, of Judea Samaria, Archelaus, Herod's son, was ruler over this area when Mary, uh, Joseph, and Jesus returned from Egypt. Um, but Archelaus was, was also so bad that the Roman government deposed him in 6 AD. So after that, Roman procurators like Pilate ruled the area. Uh, second, what we see here is Herod Antipas, another son of Herod, was still ruling in Galilee and Perea. He was deposed in 39 AD. Philip was tetrarch of the region we know today as northern Jordan and southern Syria. Uh, that was Icheria and Trachonitis. Uh, he dies in 34 AD. Luke mentions uh, Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. This is north of Gal Galilee above Mount Hermon. In Luke, in verse 2 of Luke, uh, he mentions Annas, who was high priest from the year 7 to 14 AD. Uh, he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And he was appointed by the Roman governors and was of the, he was a Sadducee and he was of the Sadducean aristocracy. And then we have Luke mentions Caiaphas, who was also a high priest from 18 to 36 AD. And he was the nominal head of the Sanhedrin. So putting all this stuff together, what do we have? John began his ministry round about 26 AD. And at that time, the word of the Lord came unto John, son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, Luke chapter 3, verse 2, the Greek term for word here is not logos. 
It's Rhema. R-H-E-M-A. Rhema means the spoken word. What does this mean? It means that John heard an audible voice calling him to begin his public ministry. That is, the spoken word of God came on to John. Now, Logos has a much wider sense. Uh, it includes both the written, spoken, and incarnate word. But Rhema is a subtype of, of the broader meaning of Logos and only emphasizes the spoken word. Now, what does this do? This, this, this direct revelation from God fulfills the promise made, that, that God made to his father, Zechariah, that his son would be a prophet. And here he is, he's revealing, uh, sorry, he's receiving direct revelation from God. And that's what prophets receive. Now, the message by John, uh, the message by John here we see in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, Mark. 1, 2 to 6, and Luke 3, 3 to 6. Uh, now, if, if you have a harmony of the gospel, you'll see from now on, we're going to have three columns, and later on, we're going to have four columns. This is the, this is the first account. Why do we have the three columns in the, in the, in the um, harmony? Because this is the first account uh, that is recorded in the synoptic gospels. Uh, synoptic, uh, why? What does what synoptic mean? It means that they're very similar. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all uh, speak about the entrance of John the Baptist. So this message by John the Baptist is the first actual account found in all three Gospels, all three synoptic Gospels. Remember, John's not one of the synoptic Gospels. Now, Mark's account in verse 2 says that John's coming is the fulfillment of Isaiah the prophet. Two prophets predicted the forerunner of the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 to 5, and Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. John here is the fulfillment of those two passages. This is literal prophecy plus literal fulfillment. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2 gives us the basic content of his message. Uh, first, repent. So it was a repentance message. It was a is a back to God message. Secondly, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So his message was also kingdom centered. So the reason for repentance is to prepare for the coming of the kingdom. That's what they need to repent for, the coming of the kingdom. Now, uh, John didn't need to, to explain the nature of the kingdom he was proclaiming. Why? Because it's obvious that he expected his audience to know what he was talking about. In fact, the Jewish audience of his day would automatically uh, have understood him to be meaning it's the messianic kingdom that he's speaking about. Um, and then third, we see in Luke chapter 3, verse 3, he was also proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Now, uh, we'll cover baptism uh, in the next session, but uh, we'll see what it means in the Jewish context ne next session. The important thing to notice here is that the people being baptized uh, by John were making a, a commitment. And that, the commitment, commitment that they were making was that they would accept uh, uh, when, as, as Messiah who John said was the Messiah. Uh, and that was, uh, that was what uh, they were committing to here. Remember, John is preparing a people to receive the Messiah. Now, by believing the baptizer's messianic message and repenting, they received remission of sins. So as we're going to see later uh, in the Gospels and in Acts, uh, that those who were being baptized by John, when they came in contact with Jesus, they accepted him as the Messiah. Now, John had a ministry of at least six months before he pointed out Jesus. So that many Jews were baptized from inside and outside the land. And later on, uh, you know, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19, uh, Paul runs into a group of Jews baptized by John who have never heard of Jesus. And when Paul told them that the one they pointed out was Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, and in keeping with, with their commitment to John at their baptism, when they heard, they believed. And then they were rebaptized into believers' baptism. 
So John's ministry was widespread. Uh, and it says he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And we're also told in Matthew verse 4 uh, that his dress code was similar to Elijah's. Uh, and, and you can see that in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 18. Um, chapter 1, verse 8, sorry. Now, what did he live in the wilderness? Uh, <laughs> it's a fantastic diet. His diet was locust and wild honey. Locusts, flying insects. Now, on the Mosaic law, all insects were forbidden to be eaten, except for one. And that one is commonly found in the wilderness of Judea. The second part of his diet was wild honey. And this is also regularly found in the wilderness of Judea. Now, initially, John had a tremendous response. Uh, and we read in Mark chapter 1, verse 5, that they came from all over Judea and Jerusalem and came down to the Jordan River, uh, which is quite a hike uh, to confess their sins and be baptized by John. Uh, so these are the common people for now. Uh, in paragraph 22, we're going to have the explanation by John. Um, I was very um, ambitious when I put the notes together. Uh, the, the next session I want to do in, a, in, in one session, in one section, I don't want to do part, part of it. Um, I've got five minutes. Hang on. We'll just do, we'll just talk a little bit about, about the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. <clears throat> just a little bit of uh, the explanation by John. Um, we see this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 to 10, Luke chapter 3, 7 to 14. Just a little bit of background about what's happening here. Under the Jewish Sanhedrin laws of the day, when there was any kind of messianic movement of note, they had to investigate the movement. Now, we see here in the, in the Gospels, we see some people that we've never seen before in the Old Testament. We see Pharisees, we see Sadducees, we see Herodians. Now, these were never spoken about in the Old Testament, but they're, they're in the Gospels. Who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the religious leaders who played a major role in various forms of first century Judaism. And they held to the belief that the oral law was equal in authority to the written law given to Moses by God. And they believed in passive resistance to Roman rule. So that's the Pharisees. Oral law means uh, spoken law. Sadducees now, who tended to, to come from rich aristocratic families, they did not acknowledge the tradition of the elders, uh, it, which is what we see the oral law is called in the Gospels uh, in the New Testament. They, they would never borrow that. And this difference in doctrine was a major area of conflict between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are always at it. Annas, the high priest, was a Sadducee, as were most of the priests. And in the first century, the high priests were appointed by Rome. And since this is how they received their power, they wanted to keep the status quo. They opposed anyone who tried to rock the boat. A third group mentioned in the Gospels is the Herodians. Now, the name implies here that they were willing to accept Roman rule over Israel as long as it came to the house of Herod. They were not a religious group, political group. Now, differing uh, religious and political views put these guys in opposition to one another and to John and the Messiah. And uh, we will leave it there now.